So welcome to the launch of the Neighborhood Empowerment Program. So our first question to get started is, how many of you have been frustrated with our with the glacial pace of New York's central bureaucracy? <laughs> Okay, so we have a solution for you. Here it goes. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm Janet. And we are the Neighborhood Empowerment Project. We've noticed that our residential streets are locked in outdated, dysfunctional designs. Our neighborhoods are inundated with traffic and cars. Our sidewalks are choked with trash and rats. Bikes are locked to poles and trees. Our central bureaucracy is charged with addressing these problems, but isn't equipped to engage at a hyper-local level. City agencies focus on networks and commercial districts and regularly offload maintenance to bids, businesses, and not-for-profits. Residents are required to go to the community boards to solve their local problems. Sadly, community boards often don't have the power to help and sometimes disagree with the requests. This leaves many residents feeling frustrated, unheard, and disengaged. Only those with access to power or knowledge know how to make change, and even for them it's a challenge. The Neighborhood Empowerment Project will give local stakeholders the tools they need to solve their problems at the local level. After all, no one knows a street like the people living on it. Our solution asks our city agencies to create a toolkit of interventions for neighborhood streets that residents can automatically implement as long as they meet specific criteria and demonstrate consensus. We're talking about simple things like installing bike racks, moving trash to the curb so sidewalks are clear, and installing loading zones to curb double parking. We will advocate for a public space manager who is based in each district and who works with the community has a budget and a team to implement and maintain improvements. Together we can solve our local problems by giving people real ownership over their streets and sidewalks. Please share your stories on our website, openplans.org. Let us know what you are working on in your neighborhood. How is it working for you? Um, before I introduce Mark Gorton, I wanted to thank Transit Center for hosting us here tonight. Thank you to Jennifer and Ben for helping coordinate this event. I wanted to introduce Mark Gorton, the chair of Open Plans and the publisher of Streets Blog and the Catalyst for the Neighborhood Empowerment Project. Mark has been an activist for many years and is always at the forefront of change. We are very excited to be working with you on this project and would love to hear your thoughts on it. Ah. So th thank you, Janet, Lisa, everyone for coming out today. Um, I'm super excited to be um, here to, to at the launch of the Neighborhood e Empowerment Project. I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room at some time has experienced the frustration of trying to get something done in the city, particularly changing our streets. I mean, particularly when it's it's a simple thing that you're sitting there going, you know, this is a no-brainer, this is one hour's work for someone, if only that could happen. But the structure of the administration of our streets is one of central bureaucratic control, um, where you have DOT, who has a very network-oriented focus, who doesn't have proper mechanisms to engage the neighborhood, and you have all of the energy and creativity of the whole city of New York that's currently channeled through a very small planning department at DOT. And as a result, we have stasis on our streets or brutal amounts of work to make anything happen. And I mean, and so we're focused on solving this, this root organizational structural problem with New York City government that makes it so hard to do all the little things and all the things that communities want. So it's gonna take a lot of energy and a lot of effort on the part of the people in this room and people in government and activists throughout the city to bring about a structural change in government. But when we do that, eventually we can have a structure where neighborhoods are empowered, where neighbors are empowered, where local blocks can get what they want, and we can also create a forum for the dialogue. A lot of what 
paralyzes DOT is that every change in this city creates a lot of noise and a lot of discussion. And we need ways and governmental structures that can actually hear multiple opinions from neighborhoods, from people in the neighborhood, and, and reach a consensus. The DOT does not have any consensus-making process. It tries to lean on community boards, which for all their flaws actually do serve that purpose to some extent, but we can do so much more. I mean, the fact is having to lobby community boards is a daunting thing for most people, particularly when it's a, a tiny initiative. So we're looking to, to bring about um, a, a structural change in the city bureaucracy, and it's gonna, we don't have all the answers. I know Lisa and John have been going and talking to a lot of people, getting a lot of ideas. This is a complicated problem with, it's going to have a nuanced solution. The solutions that work for, for commercial districts are not gonna be the same as for residential neighborhoods. So it's going to be a, a you know, a complex set of solutions from a whole bunch of institutions, but with the force of, of people, like the people in this room, we can bring about these change and, and really unleash a wave of change that comes from all of the energy and ideas that you know, people in this room and people around the city have. So it's great to, to be here uh, and to kick this off, and uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to the work we're gonna get done. So thank you so much. Great, so our panelists will discuss their experiences with local bureaucracy, present some exciting solutions that are happening in communities throughout the US, and consider how we can apply these solutions here. So let's introduce our panelists. Many of you know Christine Berté from her work in Chelsea Hell's Kitchen as the co-founder of Check Peds, the Pedestrian Safety Coalition. She's also a community board guru with years on the community board and CB4 both as board chair and currently as a transportation co-chair. Christine works tirelessly with neighbors, city agencies, and elected officials to solve everyday problems. Thank you for being here. As we were researching and meeting people at the beginning of our project, we kept getting the same question. Have you spoken with Laura Hansen? Uh, Laura was the founder of the Neighborhood Plaza Program at the Horticulture Society of New York, providing workforce-based sanitation, horticulture, and capacity building services to DOT Plaza partners in high-need communities. Before this work, she served as the Director of City Life for the J.M. Kaplan Fund, awarding grants for improving the infrastructure of public life. Ed Janoff has extensive experience in government and nonprofits with a focus on the development and stewardship of the public realm. He is currently Senior Director of Project Development at Street Plans, where he leads projects to make street improvements through active community engagement. Previously at New York City DOT, Ed helped pioneer a number of quick build, people friendly streetscape enhancements, including city bench, street seats, weekend walks, and New York City Plaza programs. Katie Laura leads IOB's community and marketing team. For those of you who don't know, that means in our backyard, um, which helps to grow, strengthen, and enrich IOB's networks of local civic leadership. Local stakeholders contact IOB to help them raise funds and secure permission from city agencies to implement their grassroots ideas. Her background is in nonprofits and urban planning. So starting with Christine. You've been in the trenches for many years, working to improve your local streets and sidewalks. Can you share with us any stories you might have from working with the city? And what are the biggest challenges you've faced? And what would you change to make government more responsive? Right. So we can be here five hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all for focus, uh, focusing on this very important subject. In corporate speak, what Mark talked about and this is called execution. So we activists are very focused on you know getting rules changed, getting laws passed, and then what happens behind that, after that. And what happened after that is unfortunately New York City government and maybe many government are very bad at implementing the changes. First of all, they don't want to, and then they are bad at it. So I have two recent examples, that, which are not necessarily new things, but six years ago, the 52nd Street Block Association wanted to swap two 
parking spot from one side of the street to the other side of the street. On one side, they had trucks. On the other side, they had you know, residential parking. And they just wanted to swap it, they wanted to, which is very simple. So we, send, we, we got the post office to support it. We got the uh, community board send a very long, detailed letter about what should be done and where. And then DOT decided to install something else. <laughs> and that created like a nightmare because it was not what was wanted. The post office was not happy. The residents were not happy. So we had multiple meetings, including the, you know, Corey Johnson and, you know, a lot of electeds and a lot of people. So every, every time you do a walkthrough, you have 10 or 15 people coming out and say, oh, yes, there are two parking. They should be over there. Oh, yes, <laughs> they should be over here. How come, etc. We send a bunch of letters. And uh, the short of it is that uh, it lasted five years. Last year, the president of the Block Association passed away, <laughs> and the parking s discussion is not resolved. So this is <laughs> sad, but insane, right? So this morning, I had another news, which is, is very fresh. There's another project we have been working on. Being pedestrian, we, uh, we have been trying to remove obstacles from the sidewalk, right? So every, every obstacle you remove from the sidewalk is another foot or another two, two feet or three feet to walk on. And one of the things in the winter on 9th Avenue is they have these enormous storm enclosures, you know, which are these vestibules which expand on the sidewalk, which are, by the way, illegal. They are illegal. So we established that it was illegal. Six years ago, we went and you know, talked to Department of Building, because it's enforced by Department of Building, and discovered that uh, they thought it was an, an ADA requirement. It had to be big. So we resolved that issue. We said, no, it's not an ADA requirement. They say, OK, fine. Then we got them to put it on 311, because we couldn't report it on 311. So that's another year. So we want, it's on 311 now. We are all excited. And you know, two, year, two years ago, we all said, OK, let's, let's report now. So we're all reporting the things. And then we get responses from 311 saying, no, there was no problem. I said, this is impossible, right? So our district manager went and escalated the situation. And the, 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 the agency say, oh, no, you know, we think it's some ADA issue. And uh, as long as it leaves five feet for pedestrian, it's good enough. And we are back to square one after six years of pushing that. This is insane. It's insane. And especially because we have the text. The law is in the books. And they have just decided to do something else. And they are not accountable to anyone. So um, you know, I don't think we are going to get any better street if the NYPD and other agencies refuse to do their job and enforce the laws. When we are passing laws, there are very little uh, follow-up from the uh, council members on how is it implemented and how is it enforced. And it, there is none. I mean, uh, there was a discussion the other day at city council, and uh, a very old council uh, council member, which is which has been there for a long time, said, oh, I'm very happy we have this discussion because, you know, we passed a law 25 years ago and nothing happened. And I said, shame on you, because you, this was your job if you passed the law to make sure it happens, right? So that's a problem. I don't think we're going to get better street if every smallest change or project takes five to 10 years to get done and consume enormous resource. And it's exactly what Mark said. is like, you know, if the resource are, uh, based on redoing every small thing, so we don't have any bandwidth to do the big things. So therefore, we cannot make any progress. The, the agencies should be making the big things, and then the citizen or another organization should be doing the small things. Um, DOT is going to tell you that they like to be incremental and come back many times to refine the same project. And that drives me nuts. We will not get better streets unless they apply the best standard possible right out of the gate, and then it's done, and you can move to the next project. So instead of doing Queens Boulevard, they are coming back 15 times to CB4 to redo the same thing over and over again. This is terrible. We can't function like that. I mean, imagine a company doing that. This is. And we're not going to get better street if the agencies or department inside agency do not work together um, to streamline the process. 
and adopt consistent standards. A good example of that is the minimum distance to preserve for right of way for pedestrians, which is right now, depending the agency, is there is none. Pedestrians don't need anything. Uh, it's five feet, it's eight feet, or it's 9.6 feet. And every time you go to a meeting, you say, what is the guideline? And even in the laws, it's completely different. So, you know, if you don't have a standard, you have to reinvent and renegotiate on every subject. And we are spending all our time renegotiating the same things rather than saying this is a standard. The other thing is that only when you have standards, you can delegate to other people. Right? So you cannot really go to a, 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 a community person or somebody else and say, look, you can do this guideline. Because right now, they don't have the guideline. So they cannot delegate, which is typical of, of a company. So we, we really need to set that up. And so without a pro proper framework for execution, we are running in place, going nowhere. We are all excited because there is one street change. Meanwhile, we have 25,000. 2,500 miles of street to change. This is not getting there, right? And it's not cheap, because my real estate taxes went up by 30% every year over the last 10 years, and it went up by 50% this year. And I don't know what I'm, I'm not happy with the service I'm getting. I'm not getting anything more, nothing. So why is, are the taxes going up so much? Why? Uh, so we need a complete re-engineering of our city government. You know, many corporations did that in the 90s and in 2010 to, take, to save money and to take advantage of the internet. And they re-engineer their processes. And they also, at the same time, establish some customer-facing organization, which really kind of deliver a better service. You know, in hotels, they allowed the, the chambermaid or whoever to give a discount or to get something without asking the boss to do that. Right now, whenever we ask for something, we have to go back and ask, you know, Polly's representative to an approval. That doesn't work that way. So um, the New York City agencies must treat the resident and businesses like customers and deploy people and system to support that approach. And until we do that, we aren't going to be scaling up. Thank you, Christine. Um, Laura, can you tell us a little, a little bit about the Neighborhood Plaza program, how the program identified and empowered local residents and worked effectively across government, with government and across agencies, and what were the challenges working across departments, and how your model could possibly be applied to the streets and sidewalks? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so I, I'm going to have a slightly more positive take on city government. I totally get your frustration, and Mark's uh, remarks are perfectly right on. But, but I've had a slightly different experience, and I think what's important to share tonight with you um, is, is that I, I do think there's room to poke government to collaborate in ways that are effective on the ground. Um, I've been doing it at a very small scale admittedly. So scaling up is the challenge and um, you have a slightly different scope than, than I w I've been doing for the past seven years. But I do think there are areas of overlap. Um, so for the past seven years, my organization worked as an intermediary between the DOT and the community-based organizations who were their um, managers of pedestrian plazas across the city and specifically high income, I'm sorry, high need neighborhoods is where we were working. Um, so the city was committed to investing in those areas, but those were the areas that had, were really um, struggling with this heavy lift of the obligation of that partnership. So just, I think everybody in the room knows the plaza program, but really quickly, it's important to understand how it works. Um, it's an application process, so communities self-select, organizations self-select to be a partner to the city, and if the plaza is built by the city, then they take on a role of maintaining and operating it. And so for a bit, uh, an organization that is not a business improvement district, that's a heavy lift. 
And, and so the Neighborhood Plaza program was structured directly in response to that. We targeted those neediest partners. We raised private money to develop a set of services that would take the burden of maintenance off of them so they could focus on what an appropriate role of a community-based organization is, the programming, the sort of eyes on the street, and, and monitoring the site and those sorts of things. So our service provides at 17 sites across the city sanitation services year round. This is important, I think, for thinking about what you're doing is the scale of, of maintenance. So these little, most of them half acre sites, they require twice a day cleaning, sometimes three times a day, year round. That's not something a neighborhood group can do for any length of time without developing severe fatigue. Um, snow removal, graffiti removal, all sorts of other vandalism issues are taken care of by our teams. And uh, horticulture, changing the flowers every, um, every season and doing regular care. And all of that's done through a workforce model, which I can talk more about if you're interested. I think it's been pretty successful in, in large part because it's a social service. It's designed to help the participants in the program as much as the neighborhoods and the plazas. Um, and then our team also provides technical assistance and capacity building to those local organizations. It's, it's um, kind of a full suite of services. And so while the scope and scale is not exactly applicable to what a neighborhood empowerment project's doing, I think there are some areas of overlap. So there are three that I want to mention. The first is maintenance. Um, you know, Everybody knows that capital money is relatively easy to secure, but it's what happens after that ribbon cutting that really matters. And I cannot overstate the importance of really consistent, high quality maintenance because it matters a lot in terms of how an amenity is perceived in the neighborhood, right? It's either a negative or a positive contributor to quality of life. Um, and it also, it's, um, it matters how those amenities function in terms of the neighborhood life. So without a reliable operations plan and a budget and a funding source, there really is, there really is trouble and it's, it's super important. Um, the second thing is sort of governance and roles between government and private local groups, intermediaries and everything else. Because the other thing that I think we all know is that public spaces thrive when there's a sense of ownership. The challenge is nurturing a sense of ownership across neighborhoods with vast differences in resources and capacities. Um, I know that you all have been thinking a lot about how to structure a process to get to your, um, the staff in every district, which I think is a, is a really ambitious and good idea, but I would really encourage you to make sure that your process really has equity at its core um, because you're not going to reach the full potential unless every neighborhood really has a fair shot at this. And I can tell you for sure that, um, that in high needs neighborhoods, if, if the distribution of allocations is not fair from the outset, that's gonna make your, your whole process really difficult to do politi politically and otherwise. Um, and then the thorny issue that goes along with that is who gets to decide who has that control, right? And we all, I think everybody here who's worked in community knows how messy that is and how different the motivations are for people to be engaged. And so, but I do think you can have a transparent process and a very inclusive process to make sure that you get buy-in at every level. And then um, there, are, there are a couple of other conversations happening around New York right now, which might you should probably tap into. I don't know if anybody's following the Urban Design Forum's fellows on homelessness, and they're talking about creating a, an office of the public realm. There's a conversation at the Design Trust for Public Space around um, operations that I'm engaged with about operations of public space. It has some similar issues, so it, you know, I think there's um, there's the new um, Civic Engagement Commission that was part of the charter revision. I think there's some interesting ways to, to broaden this conversation. And then finally, and I'll, I'll close, <clears throat> is just funding, right? I know this is right now a privately funded effort. Ours was too, but we knew from day one that was really not sustainable. And so we set out to really, I think this is very similar to what you're doing, is you have an advocacy framework and you are, um, well, we were, and I think you are too, demonstrating to the city what the costs are and what neighborhoods can contribute to it. It was a really important data for the city to know that, and we were fortunate that about five years into our work, 
under Mayor de Blasio's Plan YC, there was money allocated for plaza maintenance in our equity frame. And I think that the DOT has done a very thoughtful job of determining how to allocate that funding based on need. So I'm going to give them a, a shout out here because I also think it's a good model for other agencies. So that if, if money can be found that is really for the entire city for something like this, then it, you know, there needs to be sort of both political cover and within the agency a really clear determination of how to distribute it fairly. Um, so again, I think that there are lessons to be learned here not only for what happens on the ground but also how to work with the agency and I would say that I agree with everything that's been said about city agencies, but I also feel like there's a role for an advocacy effort like this and, and a, sort of this sort of larger community building around these issues to actually help those agencies perform better. I mean, you know, if, if within the DOT, if there were more resources, if the, if the public space division were elevated and had a little more respect within the agency, I think that actually would go a long way for all of these issues. Maybe not all of yours, but but um, some others. So I, I think the main um, point I want to get across is here that, that what <clears throat> I think we did well and I think is useful is that by having um, MPP as an intermediary that was using public funding to sort of take the heavy lifting off the table for local groups, it really allows them to operate from a space of abundance rather than scarcity and a lot of good things happen because of that. Thank you. Ed, you've worked in many cities. Tell us about empowered neighborhoods that you've seen elsewhere, especially the green benefit districts in San Francisco. And can any of that be applied here? We'd also love to hear about inexpensive changes to the street and how effective they are at empowering a community. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Open Plans and Transit Center for, for having us. Um, the firm I work for, uh, Street Plans, uh, we're best known for what's called tactical urbanism. Um, the, the principals, uh, Mike Leiden and Tony Garcia, wrote the book, Tactical Urbanism, six years ago. And I just wanted to ask by a show of hands how many people have heard of tactical urbanism? All right, so it looks about like 75%, I would say. Um, when I first read it six years ago, uh, I was working at the Department of Transportation in New York City, um, and I was like, ooh, tactical urbanism, what's that? Like, sounds cool, kind of vaguely threatening, um, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized I was quoted in the book, and I was like, oh, I'm doing tactical urbanism. Um, DOT in New York City is doing um, what I would say is uh, testing out and piloting transformations um, in an iterative way and using that to get feedback and in, in service of a long-term vision. And that's the really important part, is that you have this, this big vision and then you use tactical urbanism to say, you know, what's the next smallest thing I can do, um, often with my own two hands and my neighbor's two hands, um, to implement this change today. Um, understanding that the long-term vision is gonna take longer to implement. And, you know, the urbanism part of tactical urbanism is, is pretty straightforward. It's, you know, sidewalks and bike lanes and transit, um, public spaces. Uh, the tactical part is the tricky part. It's, it, you know, how do you get stuff done? And when you get to know, how do you go around or under or over? What is going to get something in the ground that's going to service moving your vision along? And so as consultants, we get hired by cities all across the country to try and do just that. Um, we develop plans, you know, we're, we're a traditional planning firm, um, but then it's how do you do a, a phase zero implementation? How do you test concepts while you are still in the planning process? And um, I, I can give you more of San Francisco if you want, but what I really want to talk about is uh, Burlington. Uh, Burlington, Vermont has been one of the best success stories for us because we were hired by the city of Burlington to do a pedestrian and bicycle master plan. And 
as part of that process, we did demonstration projects where we had uh, volunteers come out and help us paint bike lanes, paint curb extensions, uh, paint neck downs as part of figuring out what we wanted to put into the plan. They had never seen a protected bike lane before in Burlington. So we uh, had a group of 60 volunteers help us paint a third of a mile protected bike lane on a street in Burlington. And the city just, they loved it. And so by the time the plan was actually released, we had done, I think, 12 different demonstration projects using temporary materials, in some cases just going to Home Depot and getting uh, what's called traffic paint or, or outdoor grade paint to show and demonstrate and test these concepts. And we're really tapping into something exciting by using volunteers, by getting actual residents involved, hands-on, in implementing these changes and learning about you know, how they could make their streets more livable. And after the plan was uh, released, we then moved into the um, policy and program side of tactical urbanism, which I think there's a lot of opportunity for here in New York City, where we're trying to marry the top-down and bottom-up approach to livable streets changes. So in Burlington, um, the success of this quick build program led to the development of a quick build design guide that we designed. So showing them all the different types of materials that you would use to do pilot and demonstration projects. You know, one of the most frequent calls I get still to this day is um, what is the specification for epoxy gravel that DOT uses on all the plazas and how much does it cost to maintain a movable planter? Um, which is $150 per year per season of plantings. Um, but so to put all this kind of stuff into a design guide, then to make it a city policy that any time they're doing a transportation project, they always use a tactical urbanism approach. So they always do a phase zero um, build while they're planning it. So now anytime Burlington does any uh, traffic changes on a neighborhood street, not a highway, they always test it out or pilot it first um, with temporary materials, which is something that New York City DOT here does for the most part. But then last is they implement, so that was the, that was the tactical urbanism policy. Last was a tactical urbanism program, which was now if you live in Burlington and you as a citizen want to make a citizen-led change to your street, you can apply to get a permit, a tactical urbanism permit, to test out those changes yourself. So you would have to submit some kind of a design that you know needs to get approved by the city, but you and your neighbors um, can go out, use the design guide that we gave them, um, and implement that change yourself. And I think there's a good opportunity for that here. Our firm has not done a lot of work in New York City because there is a New York City DOT that will do these uh, temporary and pilot uh, implementations. But I think lately they are, for good reason, New York City DOT is very focused on the Vision Zero program and City Hall is focused on neighborhood equity. Um, but if you live in an area that's not a, you know, a high, fat high fatality intersection or uh, you know, a severely underserved neighborhood, you're maybe not getting as much love from the city as you might have before. And so I think that um, having a program that would allow uh, citizens, you know, with the administrative support of the agency to be able to go out and with their neighbors uh, and with their own two hands implement those changes, I think you would start to see stuff happen in the ground faster. So that's what we would like to advocate for. Um, Katie, in your work, you empower local stakeholders to re realize their vision through crowdsource funding and e providing experts who navigate the system. Can you talk us through a project and how leaders self-identify and get support? Maybe touch on the average cost and the life of a project and um, what change uh, do you think could happen if stakeholders had regular access to a government liaison and funding? Thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. Um, and I, before I begin, I'll out myself as a former uh, planner for the New York City Parks Department. So um, somebody who knows something of the nature of bureaucracies and long, um, long timeline, large capital projects. Um, but now um, I'm with IOB. Um, 
We are a, uh, a nonprofit that uh, our model is based on crowdfunding as a civic uh, engagement um, and civic leadership development tool. Um, so we work with neighbors around the country um, and uh, give them the tools to raise funds and um, step into civic leadership using our resources and our coaching. Um, I'm going to talk about non-New York City projects. I, I think you know there are some corollaries, but um, much of our work is outside of New York City, although we were founded here. Um, as you mentioned before, our name is uh, stands for In Our Backyards, so the opposite of NIMBY um, that you might have guessed already. Um, <clears throat> and it's really a model rooted in um, kind of a radical trust of neighbors to know what's best for their own neighborhoods, to know the context and the history and the challenges and the opportunities that lie um, within their particular built and social contexts, right? So we don't, um, we don't come up with the projects. We don't have a long, rigorous application process. We don't rate them on scale of one to 10 of like being successful or not. Um, we just trust people who come to us with ideas that they think will work in their own neighborhoods to try something out, right? Um, these are fairly small scale. Um, a lot of them kind of fall in the tactical urbanism realm or pilot projects. Um, our average project budget is around $4,000, but people often will raise about $500 to do something, you know, for a one day pop up or something. So these are small scale, um, often demonstration projects. And we've really found that um, through doing, you know, fairly quick timeline uh, fundraising and uh, support network building and communication within, uh, within communities and within neighborhoods, these project leaders are sort of, um, you know, forced to, uh, to try something out. It doesn't always work. It's like a way to pilot something. Um, but we think that that's a really important uh, model in uh, positioning people to become leaders in uh, civic change in their own communities. Um, the sorts of projects that we largely support, it really runs, runs the gamut. But um, there are a number of sort of community gardens, public art, um, public greening, safe streets projects, um, and then a, a lot of kind of programmatic or non-physical space or non-place-based projects as well, after school programs, that sort of thing, um, you know, food access. Um, but of the physical projects that, uh, that we work with, um, like I mentioned before, a lot of them are pilots or are sort of the temporary, you know, minimum viable product version um, of, you know, say a, a, a new crosswalk or a streetscape improvement or um, a pop-up event that demonstrates what a different streetscape could look like or a, a you know, a festival in a community garden. Um, just something to sort of show um, a quick win or um, that there is neighborhood support and community support behind positive change. Um, and we find that, you know, not only is the positive change visible within the neighborhood, but um, there are a lot of sort of um, lingering effects of that positive change that I'll talk about a little bit more um, as part of like our model of, of change because it really goes beyond just, you know, what happens on that day of the pilot or what happens when that $500 is spent. Um, we do work nationally. Anyone from anywhere can work with us. Um, but we are mission driven to work particularly in neighborhoods that have a history of disinvestment where community leaders might not have access to traditional forms of capital. They might not be, be getting the foundation grants. They might not be you know, getting um, government support. Um, and, and we do work uh, on the ground. We have community organizers um, in Memphis, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Cleveland, um, as well as here in New York City where we were started. Um, and although we do run a crowdfunding platform at iobi.org, most of our Im most important work is actually offline. So when people come to us, they might not have any experience in community organizing or fundraising in particular. Um, and these can be sort of daunting things to take on. And so um, everyone works kind of one on one with a with a coach um, who is able to provide resources that are kind of tailored to your situation, um, help you do some network mapping for, you know, who you're going to um, get to support your project, who you're going to ask for money. And really um, what it comes down to, I think, with our model is that is that fundraising, grassroots fundraising is grassroots organizing, um, and that by raising a small amount of money, showing sort of a proof of concept for something, um, you know, getting, getting buy-in from your community um, and showing something positive, that it can be a great first step to, um, you know, becoming a civic leader in your own community. Um, and we, we find that people build 
strong networks this way um, and really sort of change fundamentally the dialogue about like who is a, who is empowered to be a leader um, in a place. Um, so we work with, it, like I said, anyone from anywhere. A lot of uh, people we work with are um, probably about a third of them are you know non um, uh, non incorporated loosely affiliated groups of neighbors, so without a 501c3 status. Um, they might be all volunteer, people who have not done this kind of work before. Um, and we also do partner with, um, with government groups and city agencies um, if they have sort of a, you know, a, a stated interest in fostering um, resident leadership sort of outside and beyond the traditional civic engagement or, or, um, or neighborhood resident engagement framework. Um, so it might be around a Vision Zero plan, it might be around a sustainability plan. Um, but so we, we do work directly with, with city agencies sometimes. Um, and I just wanted to, you asked me about examples, so um, I think a f a, I'll talk about like my very quickly three f favorite examples from outside of New York City. Um, we work with a lot of, uh, or we've supported a lot of kind of streetscape redesign, crosswalk type intersection street safety projects. Um, one of them recently was uh, led by an 80-year-old crossing guard named Miss Lucille in Cleveland, um, who had been a school crossing guard for decades and just sort of stood and guarded this very, very dangerous intersection um, outside of her neighborhood school for many years. Um, she raised, I think it was about $250. It was a very small amount of money um, with us on IOB. And um, through just you know raising the flag that she was doing something positive to change this, uh, she got the attention of a group of um, volunteer urban designers who were able to kind of raise the flag with the city um, and they sat down with her and um, you know got the city's attention and now the intersection is being uh, redesigned on a city level um, and that was like a very small amount of money to, to raise the flag on that. Um, there's also sort of the pre-vitalization model um, which we work with a number of projects on. The best example of this is in Memphis so the, um, the Mid-South Coliseum is uh, an old basketball arena concert venue you, it sits on the Memphis Fairgrounds, which is this huge plot of land that divides um, a bunch of different neighborhoods in Memphis that are all very segregated from each other. But one thing that they all have in common is that they all have, um, you know, great memories of when this fairgrounds was active and when the Coliseum was um, was a place that kind of tied these neighborhoods together rather than dividing them. So um, we worked with a group called the Coliseum Coalition to imagine what a reused. Um, I mean, it's it's basically a preservation project, right? But um, but to imagine what, are, what a preserved coliseum could do, um, but without even really having an idea of it, just showing that there was neighborhood support from all of these surrounding neighborhoods that really don't talk to each other in any other way. Um, so they basically just threw a bunch of parties on the, um, on the fairgrounds. It was super fun. Um, the city has now included um, you know, the possibility of, of uh, revitalizing the Coliseum as part of its uh, scoping project for the larger fairgrounds redesign. Um, scope, which is awesome. Um, and then lastly, um, this is like maybe my personal favorite project. It was actually a project that we did uh, in concert with Transit Center. Um, in Atlanta, um, a, a leader named Bin Dom uh, took the bus a lot and um, noticed that there were no, there was no information about any like bus routes or um, times that the bus would come or anything and people would just kind of stand there and like wonder what bus would show up. Um, and so he just took a bunch of zip ties and plastic bags and printed out a bunch of bus schedules from the internet and zip tied them all over downtown Atlanta at all the bus stops. And um, rather than like being offended by this, uh, the transit agency MARTA, and he, this cost him like $500, he raised it on IOB really quickly. Um, rather than being offended by this, MARTA, the transit agency, um, had a meeting with him and they said, hey, we're actually thinking of um, coming up with a, with a, a rider-led group called MARTA Army that's basically like super engaged MARTA riders who want to contribute their good ideas to improving transit. Um, so Ben Dom is now the leader of MARTA Army and um, he has an in with MARTA. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, I, I think what I'm trying to get at through these is that there's like a lot of change that can't be measured in just the number of dollars raised. Um, we think of changes kind of sitting on four different levels. There's like what happens immediately 
there's a new community garden, there's a new temporary crosswalk. Um, and then there's a level of change that is really sort of in the mindset of the leader, right? When people think of themselves as agents of change in their own neighborhoods, um, that is really a moment, right? Um, as opposed to being like a passive consumer of a decision-making process. Um, the third level is when there are like multiple positive things happening in a neighborhood that are visible to everyone living there, it can change the narrative about this is a place where nothing good ever happens, right? Or this is a place where things have been done to. Um, and it becomes more of a story about this is a place where good things are happening and they're happening because of people like me and people like us. Um, and then lastly, and I think probably more, most important to this conversation, is change on the civic level. So when um, decision makers are paying attention, you know, like the head of MARTA did, um, to, uh, to resident ideas, resident leadership, and resident momentum. Um, it can actually, you know, if they're open to starting a dialogue and taking some of those ideas and taking some of that momentum, it can really change the power dynamic of the way that decisions are made in our communities. And, you know, I don't want to oversell this or anything, but I think that this model is actually, like, pretty a pretty interesting alternative to just like a traditional community engagement process um, because rather than just asking residents to engage within a given framework of a particular decision it's like looking at what ideas and what momentum residents actually have and trusting them to be leaders um, and I think that that's actually a sort of important moment as we have all of these discussions and thoughts about like how to repair our civic democracy and all of this not to get too heavy um, uh, okay So Katie talk, just talked about a really interesting method of, of uh, engaging neighbors basically by having to raise like five bucks or a dollar or 50 cents, you're forced to go out and talk to people. Um, so a, a big part of the Neighborhood Empowerment Project is obviously a con, you know, consensus building. That'll be part of the criteria if somebody wants to do something. Um, do any of you have favorite tools for local engagement that you found are the most effective, some kind of magic pill for, for, for achieving consensus? And then have you had to actually resolve conflict in any of your projects? Anyone? Laurie, you want to yeah. sure. Um, well, on the conflict resolution, I, I do think that's something that you guys are going to have to think a lot about in term, because what I, in, not just in the Neighborhood Plaza program, but my many years of experience of observing and working with communities, is that there are very different motivations for people to be engaged in a lot of conflicting visions. And, and so I do think that I, I love IOB's engagement process, and I think that, you know, there's just... Um, I, I'm trying to think of a, a really good example, but I know there there are a lot of great engagement groups around New York City. I mean, I think the participatory budgeting process is actually a really good one. Um, there's a group called CUP, which does amazing community engagement projects around art building, and the Queens Museum has done some amazing work around um, using artists to engage people. So uh, there's no dearth of great ideas about how to engage, but I feel like that for, for as you start to develop your process for um, bringing people together, it would it probably would be worth trying to do some fun things, you know, some and and be in a lot of different kinds of neighborhoods, and have a lot of different types of projects. So I'm I'm going to stop because I'm sort of rambling, but. Um, but I, I, it's really about process and having an appetite for process. I think that's the most important thing, to, to go slow, to really hear from a lot of people, and um, so that, that you can develop trust in all of these different neighborhoods. Sure. Um, tactical urbanism is, uh, it's not a, a design process, it's not a planning process that involves community engagement. It, the secret is that it's actually a community engagement process that results in a project. And I think um, 
we remember, I'm trying to remember the statistic, we remember, I think, 10% of what we read and 20% of what we see and hear and 80% of what we actually do, right? And so it's a really powerful tool to get something in the ground um, and to have people involved in implementing it. Um, we did a project in Providence last year, um, which was part of their CityWalk program, where we built a demonstration protected bike lane that terminated at an intersection where we had three uh, public spaces that were painted with volunteer labor um, and then they were designed by local artists. And the city said, okay, we're gonna have our build day and then once it's built, the next day we're gonna have our, uh, you know, our community celebration day. And uh, the build day, you know, we're out there painting People are walking by, what are you doing? That's really cool. We had handed them a paintbrush and a paint roller. Um, people from the bodega at the corner where we built this plaza, they're hanging out. They bring out their stereo. The salsa music is going. And we've got this beautiful mural getting painted. The next day, the city event could not come close to comparing to the amount of people and buzz and enthusiasm we had on our build day. And I think that was an important lesson for them is that uh, you know, the pilot is the process and, and the implementation uh, really is the engagement. I would like to build on that. Um, and I, I, I echo a lot. We've seen that dynamic happen so many times with the projects that we've supported. Um, and I think just as an extension of that, um, you know, when I said that grassroots fundraising is is community organizing, um, I think asking people for money, even if it's five dollars, if you go door to door in your neighborhood, um, you are forced to talk to people about your idea over and over and over again. And guess what? If your idea isn't popular, you're going to hear about it. Um, <laughs> and so we actually have seen um, a, a number of projects that aren't supported within the community you know, they don't meet their fundraising goal, it turns out. Um, and so I said before that we don't have any sort of, we don't make any sort of judgment call on like what is and what isn't a good idea. Um, we don't feel like we are positioned to be the gatekeepers for people in their communities. Um, that would be an impossible standard to hold ourselves to and we'd probably mess it up all the time. Um, but, you know, we do trust people's ability to um, use asking for small donations as sort of like a built-in um, support building and, and network growing activity and um, people have often said that like through making these asks and through engaging their communities as part of their fundraising campaigns their project ideas have gotten better. Um, they've found out that, you know, maybe like Saturday morning actually isn't a really good time to have a community event and they should move it to Sunday afternoon or whatever. Um, so, you know, this, this is like, we've heard this anecdotally all the time, but I think, you know, part of our model of trusting to people to know what positive change their neighborhood needs um, is trusting them to mess up, you know, and trusting them to try things out. and. Um, and uh, yeah. I love that trust word. Um, so we want to open it up to the audience. We have more questions, but we'd rather hear yours. So if you have a question, please raise your hand of the panel or of us. Um, so what is your idea for tactical urbanism or doing something involves something that's slightly illegal? <laughs> <laughs> You know, tactical urbanism has had an interesting evolution. I mean, it started out as unsanctioned projects and very homespun, uh, you know, a lot of hay bales and traffic cones. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I can't legally endorse your uh, illegal project here um, on video, but, you know, <laughs> it, it it is a, a powerful way, um, people seeing things happen and, and being physically involved um, themselves in change uh, is a really powerful way to keep a conversation moving and keep the ball rolling in, in the pursuit of that larger vision. Um, but I, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is I think that there should be a process where you can do things like that, that it's not unsanctioned, um, that the city should have some kind of a process to accommodate uh, citizen-led projects that, um, you know, they, they might have to be temporary in nature um, if they're experimental. Um, but, you know, what we're seeing now is 
the the process is becoming uh, more professional, um, and that you know firms like ours are doing bigger projects um, and doing them with more serious traffic engineering involved. Um, we're going to be working in Northampton, Massachusetts, over the next year, designing a uh, complete street for Main Street there, um, where, where Smith College is. And that was in the city's RFP for the uh, complete street design of Main Street. They said, as part of their community engagement funding um, for that project, they wanted us to lead a community-driven, volunteer-implemented, uh, you know, experimental test of different complete street designs there. So I think. Um, Unsanctioned is is great and it, it's important for uh, you know a conversation starter. But um, ultimately, you want to be working towards uh, codifying that kind of a process. Well, oh, on the same subject, ten years ago we had a crash, or ten fifteen years ago we had a crash at the corner of the street, and a little boy was killed. And uh, Transalt and myself, we went there and we painted a neck down. And we painted the neck down, and then we put, you know, we asked the local bid or somebody to give us plant pot, flower pot, and we put the flower pot. So we essentially created the same things, and it was not permitted, right? But it was not dangerous either. It was a piece of paint, and everybody was uh, very happy to see that. And I remember how. You know, after that, DOT called me and said, did you put that down? And I said, yes, I did. <laughs> and, you know, but if we had had a process for that, imagine every time there is a crash and a fatality or an injury, and we could go and paint a, a bulb out and put three pots of, of, of grass there. Imagine how powerful that would be for the families and for everybody to say, you know what, something was done right away. And then it may not stay forever because it's not the right thing. And they come back and they measure it in two months and say, oh, that's not good. But you know what, for right away, it would be something like we did something. And people would be so anxious to have an action, and an action which actually slowed down the traffic. Because as you said, everybody was stopping and saying, what did you do, what is this, how come, etc. It was, it was a very powerful thing. And, and I think if we had the power to do that, if it was sanctioned, I, we did it at the time when <laughs> it was not sanctioned. And we, uh, I think it would be very, very powerful and very good for DOT, because DOT would get the credit of, OK, you, something was done immediately would be a great credit, rather than everybody say, oh my god, this has been two months and five months and you know nothing has been done. So it turns into a negative where it could be a huge positive. All you CB7 folks, listen up. <laughs> Sarah. Yeah, I guess to follow up, I'm wondering, given your experience working at DOT, if you have any advice on getting those kind of sanctions, because we are looking at some of these things, <laughs> yeah. you know, your, your insight. <laughs> well, the Neighborhood Empowerment Project will hopefully get that stuff sanctioned, but... Right, the tactical is the hard part, right? It's, it's uh, you know, and the question that we're here, I think, uh, talking about tonight is, you know, neighborhood empowerment, right? How do you empower neighborhoods, but how do you... Who has the power is, is kind of the difficult question. Um, and how is the DOT administering or structuring that in a way that is equitable and democratic? Um, you know, something that frightens me about the concept of neighborhood empowerment is what happens when you're empowering um, something that's anti-urbanist, right? Um, you know, if you empower people in neighborhoods like, uh, I think it was College Point, Queens, where a community board passed a resolution say, never ever come to us with a bike bike lane proposal because we don't want any bike lanes uh, in this entire neighborhood. You know, and that that's a, a kind of a, a pretty um, global sentiment in that neighborhood. And if I if you empower them, you know, you're gonna get like sidewalk removal for more parking. <laughs> like crazy stuff. And, um, and but on the flip side, you know, Jane Jacobs was like the ultimate NIMBY. She was uh, you know totally working against government and, and trying to work the grassroots power, but in an urbanist uh, service. So um, that, that power dynamic is very tricky because you want to make sure that you, you the, the 
the uh, service is is democratic and urbanist. And so um, I'm kind of tiptoeing around this question a little bit, but um, <laughs> my my answer to, to how to get DOT to do stuff is maybe it's because I was there for five years. I, I think that our DOT, compared to many of the ones that I work with throughout the country, is very responsive and very effective, and it's one of the most resourced DOTs um, anywhere. And I think that I, I would encourage people to um, you know, explore all channels to to communicate with them, but then at the end of the day, like I said, if you're if you're not getting the love, I think what you need to do is try to move the projects on your own using whatever tactics are necessary, using whatever is the you know biggest increment of change that you can affect. And if you can't get DOT to come out and implement a street change, then see if you can get DOT to approve um, you know a pilot project. And if you can't get that, then see if you can get them to do a a one day project, or you know just get a block party permit and just you know, close down the street for one day and paint what you want to do and then take a picture of it and then it goes away the next day. But, you know, just try to keep moving the ball little by little. And then I just want to add one thing that <clears throat> this is more at the meta level, but there are a lot of people in this room who I think have a shared vision of the city. And I do, I said it earlier, I think that there is this division within the Department of Transportation that was created under Jeanette Sadiq Khan that doesn't get to do all the things that it would like to do. And it could also use some support. I mean, you know, it's the di public space division, the division that, that Ed worked in, and it's fairly small, and it competes within the agency with everything else. And so there is a role, and I'm not saying, you know, you need to get what you want, and I understand that, but there is also a role for this community of advocates to speak up on behalf of what happened in the last administration under Jeanette, and where is it? And why aren't these things elevated, and why aren't they moving? I mean, I think those are fair questions to ask, and it has to do a lot with agency politics. And Ed, I just want to add on to what you were saying. The Neighborhood Empowerment Project is really focused on neighborhood initiatives, not network. And so, you know, those people would not be able to block a protected bike lane because that's a network issue. Could you talk about the hierarchy a little bit? Yeah, I think Janet wants to talk about the hierarchy. Yeah, um, so, well, there, there are a few things. One, because because the idea is, you know, it is on a local basis and it, it, it's not going to be, a, you know, an imposition on somebody. But for this to work, we do need, you know, and the ideal is, is a cooperation of DOT and the other agencies to work with us to create the hierarchy and to create a toolkit of interventions. Because the problem now is that we find that there's just no transparency. People ask for something and it's like, no. You know, and what's you know, and we don't know what it costs, or they, you know, something that should be inexpensive like a speed bump. Christine has a two hundred thousand dollars speed bump in her neighborhood. You can get one online for thirty-five thousand. Um, but uh, so we do need DOT to work with us and to recognize that by delegating and offloading these really small things, that they will be free to do what they're good at, which is the big stuff and the networks. Um, so we need them to create a hierarchy of streets that are non-network streets, you know, mostly neighborhood streets, and to create this toolkit of interventions that are really small and simple and cheap and allow us to implement them with a small budget. Okay. And, and then you know, and then there is um, there are some things happening out there that this isn't so crazy. There's something called a Clean Up Clean New York initiative that was legislated. There's 11 million dollars for it. Every city council person gets 250 thousand dollars, and they use that money to supplement cleaning services in their neighborhood. So why can't we have 11 million dollars and 250 thousand to each community board to? put up a no parking sign or a no standing zone or something super simple. I mean, that's the stuff we're talking about. Um, I'm just curious, there have been mixed comments about community boards and how community boards relate or don't relate to the kinds of things that you're talking about and want to empower. And I'm just curious to hear from you who are leading the initiative and other people on the panel, how do you see this effort engaging with community <coughs> boards, which do have a role in government, but was intended to be? support community empowerment and 
Yeah, thank you for the question. So we have a couple answers to that. We do have a lot of community board folks here, and we really appreciate them coming. We really see the community board as a partner in this and a place where they can um, really support the initiatives and make this process as democratic as possible. We want to bring more people into the community board because we feel like the community board currently is not a very democratic place. We don't think a lot of people are engaging and we would like to see more engagement. Um, and so we feel like with these tools that we have, we can actually reach more people. Um, but we will be working with the community board, not against them. So, so just to, um, to say a few more words on that topic. So, um, I mean, obviously community boards are imperfect. But they also are a place where there is some sense of what the neighborhood wants. We might not always agree what every community board says, but um, I mean, that serves a very useful purpose there. So it, I think there are certain <coughs> neighborhood-wide initiatives for which a community board is the approximately right unit of size to make a, a decision. Now, we can discuss what the makeup of the community board, there's lots of you know, tactical things that can be done to improve community boards, and I actually think the term limits that are coming up, it may, means that community boards in the future will, will be more open-minded than they are today and things like that. But at the same time, if you're talking about a block level change, you know, you want a loading zone on a block or a car share spot or a bike rack. A community board, I mean, it's basically 160,000 people on average in a community board. That's a small city. I mean, and anyone who knows, you know, there's 30 people on a community board. They're, they all have limited time. They're hard to lobby. They're not necessarily the most open-minded. And if you go to somebody and you say, hey, I want to get a change out of the community board, all you have to do is talk to these 30 people who are not the easiest people to talk to. That, that can be overwhelming for most people. I mean, you, what you have is the, you know, a handful of people in this room who are the superheroes who can do that, but that's enough to crush most initiatives there. And I, so what I think about what, what we need is a framework for decision making which can be facilitated by community boards which in many cases has units of decision that are much smaller than a community board, maybe just a block level decision or a fraction of a block or something like that. And this is partially about not just DOT, but the, the borough president's office, the city council, defining what the rules are, defining who's in charge. You know, in some cases we have bids who are sort of functionally in charge of some neighborhoods. There's something about just that ownership. You may not love everything a bid does, but the fact that someone is there with clear decision-making power, because it's, I think, the lack of pl clarity that kills us today. On every street, the answer is DOT. And as Christine said, like even a simple thing like moving a parking spot eventually you know, needs to practically go up to the commissioner or the mayor to get anything done, and that just systematically disempowers people. Even if we have an, a somewhat arbitrary system with you know, little dictators and it's not a great process, if it's just clear local decision making, I think that would in many ways be better from than the, the, the bland you know, kind of hand of bureaucracy that just kind of snuffs out everything. And I think if we have these clear sets of things where you know there it's DOT lays out clear policies what does it take to get a loading zone you know what vote do you need from the block from the neighborhood then we we have a a, a framework to start having these discussions happen right now there's no clear decision making framework so essentially any loud minority can veto anything I think that, you know, again, community boards are capable of generating a clear vote on things. In, so, in a lot of cases, DOT doesn't respect that vote. I think if they set up the framework correctly where they say, you know, you can't vote for unsafe things. You know, no one wants a truck route on their street. You can't, you know, these are network oriented things. Sorry, you're just going to have to suck it up and have a truck route. Sorry, you're going to have to suck it up and have a bike lane. You know, these are things that DOT has a moral and practical responsibility to say. 
And then there's a thousand little things that if we make the decision making framework small, it's not too burdensome. If there are clear policies, hey, you want to, you know, have a trial with two parking spots, you know, fill out this piece of paper, you get to do it, have a conversation. Like right now, people are saying, what can I do that's illegal? That shouldn't be illegal. And, and, I, and it, it, there's a lot of people in this room who want to see change, who are not willing to do illegal things, who don't want their cause tarnished by having to do illegal things. And we need to get that framework established so that it's easy, legal, possible, and there is local decision making about small local things and frequently smaller than community boards. But community boards are also a forum where discussion can happen, where people can meet, they have spaces. There's a lot that can happen. Do you, you want to add? So Christine, our community board expert. Right. No, but an example on CB4, what we do is a lot of decisions are taken at the block level, exactly what you're saying. So block associations are a very fundamental building block of decision making. And we defer to them a lot because we have a portion of the community board, as you say, it's 120,000 people. It's very different, right? You can have one section which is one way, another section. So we say the block association is, in, in a sense, in our mind, the decision maker. And then they come up to us and then we say, well, have you gone through those steps? So for example, for changing a parking slot, we say, okay, you have to make a petition of everybody around you. We want everybody to be signed up that you want to change the parking because it shouldn't be just for you, it should be for everybody on the block, right? But so, so we have, in a sense, created what you are talking about, a, a, a decision process where we tell them if you bring A, B, C, D and you have done those things, then we're going to approve it, but indeed we cannot make it happen. At that point, it would be good that we can say, okay, and this is the prototype, go do it. And we don't have to go to the DOT or whatever, but indeed you have to have that decision process created so that everybody is not you know, furious at each other all the time, because you are going to have, even on the block, people which are not in agreement, and we have that situation right now on one block where half of the people want a no turn and the other half don't want a no turn, and you know, this is like, okay, what are we going to do? And, but, but that's, I think that's, the, the, the block in my mind is really the right unit of organi organizing and, and, and uh, putting together what we want. And then with the community board, you can have a checklist of, okay, have they done the homework properly? And then they can go to the next step. Christine's on our board here. <laughs> but, but that's actually, I mean, that, that's very clear. And thank you, Christine, because the idea is just to make the community boards really more robust so that, that from uh, the idea to actually the implementation is like, boom, you know, it's there, they have a budget, they have a small staff, they can do it. And so, so that's how we're ideally going to work together. Disclaimer, I serve on CB4 and I'm on the board of check pads. Um, and what Christine says is correct. In fact, if people go to committee meetings, they can really have an input within the community boards. But my question is, I hope it's not too much off topic, is several things. One is, there's, we got, you get the bike lane. But the problem is there's construction and the city, there's no coordination between DOB and DOT. So they make a beautiful bike lane or they pave the street and then there's a spectrum cable network six months down the road. And then they pave that and it's bumpy and then another uh, private company comes in and breaks up and gets the permits. And also with construction, they close off the streets and they can close them off for two, three, five years. There's no, between DOB and DOT, there's no, and that's the end of your bike lane or it's a district. And another topic that's really bugged me for years, in Europe they use great gravel, supposedly very good high quality. In this country we use such poor quality gravel so the roads don't last as long. So I wonder if, I mean you all talk about getting projects done, but I'm talking about projects that we have or things that we have, how do you handle that? I mean, in a large city, not New York, not like Providence or Northampton. I mean, that's a big problem and Christine talks about agency silos a lot. Um, it's not really in the purview of what we're doing with neighborhood empowerment because we're not really talking about big network changes like that. Um, but did you want to address that at all, Christine, about agency silos and what you do? Well, I, I mean, you know, that's that's one of the challenges is that each agency does their thing and it all comes together on the ground in the community. And once now you are, con 
you know, confronted with exactly that subject where we need to we need to call five or six agencies to try to resolve who is doing what, and that's very very burdensome. So. I don't, I don't know, this is like in other company, problem determination, you know, and then how do they direct the problem to the right place, and how do they do that very fast, and that's a system that doesn't exist in our city. You don't have the, the uh, you know, customer service where you call and say, okay, it's broken, what do we do, and then it's broken is like five agencies behind it. We don't have that level, and, and I think this is something which is sorely missing. Now, the district managers of the community board do that job. That's, that's one of their job, is they, they go and they call all the agencies, and they collect them, and they bring them, but it's very cumbersome. I mean, it's really, really cumbersome, and, and I think we need another process there uh, to be changed. It, it's something that our firm has been thinking a little bit about, and we're located in Dumbo, and we've been talking to the Dumbo bid because there's a bid, and they couldn't do stuff, and there's a lot of construction going on in Dumbo, and um, I, I've heard a lot of complaints about the impacts of construction on neighborhoods and how that affects the pedestrian realm and, and how that impacts traffic, and, you know, this is another one where I'll say, you know, compared to other cities that we work with, New York City does a pretty good job, you know, and you, you might not like the results, but, you know, DOT does have a HIQA unit, which, you know, anytime anybody pulls a permit, they have to go out and approve the way the street is put back. And in a lot of times when it's a big utility project, they actually have somebody sitting there watching them, uh, making sure that, that the work is being done to their standards. It doesn't always come back, you know, sometimes when they put the bike lane back, like it's kind of funky looking and the green paint is different and, you know, there's gravel all over it. But I, I would say, uh, compared to other places that we work, we've we've seen a better job here. But, you know, the, you know, the it is a low bar. The, you know, the process of, you know, what's called the, the maintenance and protection of traffic plan um, is, you know, it goes through DOB and then there's a small unit at DOT that reviews it. Um, where when they're doing construction, they say, here's how we're going to maintain pedestrian safety, and you know, here's how we're going to route it. And that's not a public process. Nobody gets to opine on that plan. And I, I wouldn't necessarily propose that every time someone's doing construction that you now have to have some kind of a hearing and community board. That's just going to slow everything down too much. But it would be nice if there was a way for people on the block level or the community level to say, this maintenance and protection of traffic plan isn't working for us. Um, there's other things that we think could be done. Or if there was a way to, you know, add on, you know, changes, you know, you'll see that construction will often change uh, the patterns of the way people use the street. Um, we've seen this in Dumbo. I saw this around Madison Square Park where we actually, we measured that when a scaffolding went up, um, one side of the street went from having a 700, uh, 700, uh, people in our foot traffic, uh, sorry, went from 1,200 to 700. People were using the other side of the street. And that has implications to, you know, maybe we should be actually changing the geometry of the street or the signal timing of the street. And so I would like to see that in the instances of construction, particularly long-term construction, more opportunities for um, for the block level and community level to get involved in making temporary changes that go along with that construction. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to add one quick thing. So in the structure that you've described for for NEP, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you're going to have, uh, tell me if I'm saying this right, you have a, a staff person at every, in every of the 51 council districts, is that right? Um, so there's going to be a, immediately an association of people, right, who I'm assuming part of the structure is that they get together periodically, that they become an entity, right? And so I do think there would be a mechanism through that for what Ed is describing that maybe you don't deal with the issues that were described in the question, but there is a pipeline of information and part of what your service could be is providing ways for that information to get to the right place through this. The bid association is a great model, right? They are a trade association that has a lot of political clout at this point, work really well together, provide expertise across neighborhoods. So I think that, that there is a way to structure what you're doing to be a little bit more, at least, 
a mechanism to get information into the agencies. No, no, uh, exactly. It's sort of interesting because IOB, in order to get their projects through, they have a person who's an expert and and managing the bureaucracy. So this person who would be housed in the neighborhood and the public space manager would be supporting the district, who be supporting the district manager. That would be the liaison across agencies. He would have to be empowered by, you know. The, however many, you know, are four or five major departments. So now also if you have 10 of those people yes. hearing the same complaint, then they have more power to take that complaint up. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to stop with the questions. And if you have questions for us or of our panelists, please come find us afterwards. I want to first thank our panelists. Thank you so much. And if you were curious, inspired, uh, want to learn more, we do have a booklet of our initiative over there. Please take them. Thanks, Clarence. <laughs> uh, we also have a statement of support that if you could sign, we would love that. Um, and we'll be in touch with our initiative as it continues to grow. Thank you so much for coming.